We're live. Welcome, everybody, to the second episode of Harmony Unleashed. I'm here with my good friend and incredible composer, arranger, orchestrator, saxophonist, Remy LaBeouf. He is the chair of jazz studies at the University of Denver. He is the guest conductor of the Nordcraft Big Band, and he is the leader of his own big band called Assembly of Shadows. And let me just add that Remy is just a good, awesome dude um, who I'm I'm very proud to to be able to feature on this series today. So Remy, what's up, man? How are hey. you? Good to see you, Stephen. Great to I'm, see you. I'm doing well. Yeah, it's uh it's a uh, not too freezing day over here in Denver. And uh, yeah, I'm just uh, writing up a storm over here. Are you writing up the Denver storm? Are you bringing the storm? No, there are no storms in Denver. You know, it's just all sunshine. But, um, but yeah, yeah I'm doing something. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you, you, you care to share with us? What are you working on right now? Um, right now, I'm actually kind of, kind of, um, um uh random i'm i'm working with uh this cellist named uh, sahara on um a project of hers um doing a an arrangement of running up that road by kate bush for like a, a classical pianist classical cello but then jazz bass and jazz drums so kind of an unusual project but i'm working on that and then i'm going to write another thing of, of my own for their project amazing so, what what makes it unusual time. What makes it unusual? Oh, I feel like the combination of like classical players and jazz improvisers, like that's a, an unusual, like maybe if it was, you know, if everyone was improvising or everybody, everything was notated, you know, or maybe like it was a jazz trio with a cellist, you know, but it's, uh, yeah, we got drum and bass and I think she's based in Montreal. So that's going to be fun. Got you. So when you're writing for, for that, I, I had a totally different set of questions planned to ask you, about, <laughs> but, I, but I'm super curious about this. And, and I, I hope you don't mind if we just dive in here, but like when you arrange for that kind of instrumentation, so that's like a pretty small, small group. Just remind me, what is the instrumentation exactly? A cello and rhythm section. Cello and rhythm section, but the rhythm, but part of the rhythm section is a classical piano. Pianist does not improvise. I mean, maybe in a kind of contemporary classical music way, but not, So when not you not arrange for that kind of a group, do you approach it differently? than when you would arrange for like a big band or a different large ensemble like what what is the same what is different in there for you yeah i don't know i'm I'm figuring it out right now but um i think a lot of it's the same i mean whether whatever i'm writing for if it's if it's big band or orchestra or solo saxophone like the guts of the piece are the same like i'm i'm looking for you know uh strong melodies and and themes and i, I think i develop them in similar ways and uh, in terms of, you know, the like reharmonizing sections and putting things in different contexts to make them more interesting, I think a lot of that that work still happens no matter what I'm doing. So, for sure. And is this your first time writing for that kind of an instrumentation? I mean, not really. Um, I mean, I've done a lot of writing for strings or kind of chamber jazz strings. Like I did a bunch of a couple albums with LaBeouf Brothers for the string quartet, a bunch of mixed, mixed like chamber stuff. There's actually, I'm getting two pieces premiered today with this guy, Caleb Hudson. And he's got this like super group of like badass classical musicians. This uh, like the cellist, uh, Michael Nichols from uh, Brooklyn Riders is in it. Tessa Lark, Emmy Ferguson, like some like Mark Dover is playing clarinet. Um, and is that everybody? And Caleb Hudson on trumpet. But like, it's like this chamber ensemble and um, and I, I really had fun writing for them. It's not jazz at all, but like, oh man, some of, I had I had so much fun for that pro writing for that project. And they're premiering the stuff today, and I'm not going to be there, so I'm sad. But any Austin yeah, that, people, you got to go check it out. That's the classic, <laughs> the plight of the working composer, arranger, orchestrator. How often do you think you get to hear the stuff you play live? Well, usually I I'm the one who writes it, it or it's usually my band premiering it. So you know. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, but yeah, it's it, it's it's cool to work in in other area in other genres with different different artists, um, different processes. So yeah, well, man, uh, have, you done, have you done a lot of classical stuff? Like, you know what? Like here or, and there, yes. But yeah. the thing that really intrigues me about the pro the project that you're working on right now, just in terms of the classical piano, like being a member of the rhythm section and like the traditional jazz sense of the word rhythm section but then also 
being that they don't improvise i mean to me what what i hear when you say that is that this person you have to write out for them like precisely exactly what notes to play for the entirety of the piece right pretty much like, i mean i don't have can. to i mean i could there are certain gestures or kind of like things that i could have them do i could give them like a set of notes and be like do this with this set of notes like cells and stuff like that i mean big band composers do that kind of stuff erica seguin darcy you know like um, and probably their predecessors as well. But like, um, yeah, I think um, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing some stuff. I'm starting with the arrangement because I think that'll be easier and it'll help me get comfortable with the group. But most of the piano stuff is pretty notated at the moment. But, um, you know, like I'm not going to notate the drum set stuff completely. I mean, that's going to be, you know, leave a lot of stuff up to the, the, the freedom of the drummer. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to put a drum solo in there. You know, that's going to be fun. So there, it's going to be improvised, but, you know, for the people who like to improvise, and it'll be notated for the people who want to be notated. <laughs> yeah, so. right. No, I love that. Performer first. So, you you know, one of, one of my favorite parts about your writing is the way that you are able to develop your ideas over the course of, um, of a piece. And, you know, one of the, like, the way that you start neener neener for example um on your last record and the way that it ends like there's a clear like trajectory throughout the piece that like the ideas develop and and like change and morph and like they just are alive um oh, thanks. And, I, and i also like that when you're like what you said about approaching this composition this project that you're arranging for um for this group, I don't know the name, but um, if the group has a name, just the individuals you mentioned. But I, I like what you said about the guts being the same. Like you're still going to develop the ideas in the same way. Like even though it's Remy LaBeouf with the big band, you know, and it, that produces a certain thing. Like it's Remy LaBeouf with now this new instrument instrumentation, and so you're able to write for different colors, et cetera, but that the way that you develop the ideas is, is similar. Can you talk a little bit about like how you might approach uh, developing the ideas um, before mm -hmm. you approach the orchestration part of the process? Oh yeah, interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff to cover in there. I mean, I think I'll start by saying that I think that like spending time in these different worlds makes me stronger in each one of them. You know, like it gives me something to bring to the big band world if I'm writing stuff that's not big band music or like, you know, I, I think the way that I uh, approach a lot of, a lot of actually teaching as well, you know, a lot of composition education, jazz composition education stuff is really focused around arranging and, you know, voicings and like drop two and like, we're gonna, this is a shout chorus and, you know, like, um, and stuff that can be put into a textbook. But I think that, you know, you can perfectly arrange something that's like not that happening um, and not that well structured, especially, you know? So I think, you know, focusing on like the bones of the piece or the guts, I think I said earlier, you know, I, I think is really important, you know, having a, uh, a strong, clear, melodic arc, and that that just gives you material to develop. And um, I was looking at um, analyzing uh, Bartok's uh, second string quartet um, from uh, second movement, and just like looking at the themes, like he has like his first like I don't know six bars or something, and everything in the piece comes from that first six bars. It's so clear. It's so strong. The flavor is so strong of that piece because he's just he's just exploring these couple colors at the beginning and just getting the most out of them and just really telling a story with them. And um, I think the more I've, I, I've I, when I started doing a lot of composing, I was like, I'm all about like, you know, the idea, creating the, the kind of interesting theme itself. But now I'm getting much more into like, Oh, the theme can be anything. It's, it's, it's all about the development of that theme that, that makes something interesting. Like you could take two notes and it'll be like awesome, depending on how you develop it. So, um, so yeah, you wanted to hear me talk about development or like tools of development or like stuff I do or like, man, I, there's just so much, there. there's so <laughs> much that, that you said in there. That's, that's really cool. Um, I would love to hear like your, your, you talk about your approach to to development um but 
you know, just in terms of like the different worlds, like just for, for clarity, I think like, did you mean like different instrumental wor worlds? Like when you're writing oh. in different instrumental worlds, like you write in the big band world and that makes, and that gives you this and you write in the orchestral world and that yeah. gives you that and you write for a chamber group and that gives you another thing entirely. Is that what you sure. meant by? I mean, it varying degrees of that, you know, it's like, it could be like, oh, you you do a lot of like modern jazz, like small group stuff and you bring that to the big band. Or it could be like, you do a lot of like, you know, production-based music and indie rock or something and you bring that to the big band or, you know, polka big band or, you know, like whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, like, or, and, and vice versa, you know, like I might be bringing like jet, like, you know, jazz stuff and big band experience to when I write to, for an orchestra. And that makes me different than other orchestral composers who are only checking out, you know, orchestral music. So I don't know. I, I do. You, how do you feel about it? You know, are, are you influenced by a lot of like primarily big band stuff when you're writing for big band or are you are you you're, you're checking out other stuff, too? Right. You know, the way that I think about it is that music is music. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a certain amount of musical DNA that is constant over whatever medium is being used as the vehicle to present that musical DNA. And the musical DNA is comprised, as I hear it, of rhythm, melody, and harmony. Mm -hmm. And between those three elements, you sort of have everything that's there. You know, the arrangement is just the order of the events, and the orchestration itself is just the presentation of the way that you hear those notes being played, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, that's that's interesting to me to hear your reflection on, like, you know, how your experience in the big band world would, would give you a different thing when writing for orchestra than somebody who is just writing for, for orchestra uh, might might have. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's that's super, I mean, it's just, it's it's you, like it's Remy LaBeouf, like going from, from one medium to the next, but you don't change. It's just the, the medium to realize the visions mm -hmm. that's changing. Um, and yeah, I hear a lot, like, a, you know, especially like the indie rock thing. I hear a lot of that in your, in your writing. What, what is the song that da, 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 da. you have it on the, like, that's just the beginning. Oh, the Minnesota, Wisconsin. I mean, that's an actual indie rock that's, song, but yeah, I, I know to the Bon Iver song. Yeah. Yeah. The Bon Iver song. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, man, I, I hear it and, you know, um, I heard it still when we were like doing the BMI workshop together. Um, that was fun, man. I had so much fun in that workshop with you. <laughs> yeah, fun. Um, yeah. And then the other question that I wanted to ask just before we talk about development was, um, I mean, I, it sort of leads into the conversation on development, but the way that you were talking about like, okay, you can arrange perfectly a piece that might not be happening. Um, did I remember what you said correctly? That's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of people focus on what does that mean? Yeah, composition basically. Like, I I don't I think it's it's easier to teach arranging, in some ways, and so like. I think um, the the process of composing a song is is um, it's harder to to address when you're learning and you know like there's not a as clear and obvious instruction manual for how do you compose a song, like what book is that. Well, Gil My Goldstein God. has a great book. About, oh, he's got a good one. Yeah, called okay, the yeah. Composer's I mean, Companion. <laughs> just I'm I'm sure there's like to throw great it up to my out there. I'm, yeah, I'm just like revealing how how um um uh um what's the word I'm looking for? Like um how much of an idiot I am, just not knowing that not idiot, but Come like on, uh, Randy, that's, but like that's misinformed, like. you know. But uh, but I don't know. I, I think <laughs> I I I love like um. I love like picking apart songs to to figure out like why does it why does it work you know why does it sound so good even like jazz standards like there's a lot of there are a lot of patterns and I think a lot of these patterns kind of shape the way that we hear melodies like um, and then we write melodies like those patterns because they shaped us it's like the Mona Lisa is good because we say it's good and it's also you know we say it's good because it's good it's a kind of like chicken or the egg kind of situation but I think. We have a certain, I think it goes back to language and the way that we communicate with language. You know, I think yeah. there's a lot of music in language. Man, 100% um, and vice yeah. versa too. I, you know, I, I tend to, to think that like the process of 
teaching composition is more about the process of of um teaching somebody how to learn about themselves you can't you can't totally. i can't teach you how to be you right like i can give you a certain set of inputs that maybe you haven't been exposed to before because i'm me and i'm different from you because i'm me right mm -hmm. and vice versa right if you were to to teach me right mm -hmm. and when i check out your music I, i'm totally happy to like steal this steal that uh -huh. uh, you know I, I i love it and that's composers have been doing that for centuries when we start talking just on the language front when we start talking we learn from our parents what our vocabulary is uh, mm -hmm. from them they teach us like mama dad da. and then we get other words out of that afterwards like you know um one of my first words yeah, was what's mick. your next word <laughs> my first my first word was mick which was short for music actually oh um, wow that's nice and, and but but you you develop um at your character and your personality in some ways due to the language that you speak mm -hmm. And the language that you learn depends on your environment and the people that you are exposed to slash you expose yourself to. And I think that's part of the reason why many people who know multiple languages say that they have a different personality in each of the languages that they speak. Mm. Yeah. So tying this back together to, I mean, this, this is like, I'm just thinking aloud here. I'm just, I'm just going, going with the flow of, of um, what you said about, you know, Remy LaBeouf brings something different to an orchestral project because of your experience in big band than somebody who is just checking out orchestral music, right? Your your personality, your character is different um, as a result of those exposed in, inputs, musical inputs, right? And your musical personality is still able to come through um, mm -hmm. through that medium because you're you're you. And I just think that while it's harder to teach composition. I actually, in some ways, think that teaching composition at all is a fallacy. I don't think that it's possible. I think that that sometimes learning composition through the process of learning arranging, right? Hmm. When you're arranging, you're still having to come up with new musical DNA, right? If I want to write a <clears throat> write a counter melody for, I don't know, I, I, like I've got the world on a string, for example. Sure, sure. Dee -de -dee -de. D, D, I mean, yeah, that is that. Yeah, composing and arranging is kind of intertwined there, because yeah, you are inventing a thing. Sure, yeah. It might not be the thing, right? It might not be the main musical DNA, but it's it's in there, and I mm -hmm. think that that it gives people the opportunity to get to know themselves in a setting that feels mm -hmm. safe in some ways. Yeah, yeah, a little less overwhelming. I mean, sure. Yeah, I hear that. I mean, yeah. What do you I think, think, professor? I think a lot of it comes down to making choices. You know, it's like as composers, so much of what we're doing is we're trying we're we're trying to get from point A to point B. You know, I want to get from this A section to this bridge or whatever. I want to get from this chord to this chord. I want to recapitulate, but I'm in this weird key. And how are we going to gracefully, you know, get back here or ungracefully and like have a strong like juxtaposition of character, like key, whatever. But like, right. Um, I think, yeah, I, we can guide people through making choices. We made a lot of choices. I think a lot of people are afraid to make choices. And um, a lot of, I feel like what we do as composers, we just explore a bunch of possibilities and pick our favorites. And the act of picking our favorites, we have certain favorites that we come back to, and that's how we kind of develop these identities. But, um, but like, I don't know, even like that example of a counter line, it's like, okay, yeah, you know, there's a time and a place for a counter line, you know? Maybe, you know, you want to have put that counter line in the space between the melodies, or maybe it's too busy or, you know, um, there's, there's so much. Yeah. But it, it all comes down to choices. It's like, okay, you made this choice. Why did you make this choice? Did you think about that choice or was it an autopilot choice? Did you make that choice because somebody else did it? You know, what other choices have you not considered? I feel like a lot of it's like a kind of like Socrates way of learning is like asking people questions like, great, did you consider this and this and this and this? And then, you know, after all that, cool, you like this choice. Good. Let's move on. Next thing, you know. So I don't know, a lot of choices, a lot of a lot of point A's to point B's. I feel like that's what we do. Why do you think people are afraid to make choices? Oh, we're getting big existential, right? I mean, 
So let's go with the soccer user, this, right? Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll keep it to we'll keep the choices. Responsibility, to you know, you make a choice, you're accountable for that, and you could make a bad choice, and then that bad choice reflects you, and you feel like you are bad choice. You know, like you 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 represent bad decisions, and then that right. becomes the way you see yourself, and you know, you can be insecure about. It. You know, like I'm just like going going off on a tangent here, but. I think you can also be like really proud of your choices and everything, but um, uh, yeah, the choices can be scary for sure. How do you deal with the process of making quick decisions in the writing process if you have a deadline that is coming up super quickly? Oh, I want to know what how you would answer this too. Um, how we'll do I deal with it? First. I've gotten, I, what's that? I said, we'll take turns, you first. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Deadlines. I need deadlines. Deadlines are my friend because otherwise, like, I never finish things. So I'm really grateful for deadlines. But I think it's important to like plan your life around, like, know your limits, know how how you work, and like, not set yourself up for unhealthy, you know, situations. You know, where you're pulling a bunch of all nighters. I mean, sometimes it happens. Sometimes you know, you get hit up to do a film score kind of thing. Like, didn't you have something like this where you had to like, somebody hit you up and like, hey, we need this thing for TV like tomorrow. Like, I mean, that stuff you can't really plan for, but um, but uh, there's a kind of excitement to like, you know, racing to finish something. But um, I think I mostly, I just, I'm, I'm more realistic with myself. I feel like I've gotten to the point where I can, you know, I know, I know how to like create the time to, to do stuff. I don't know. That's not a fun answer, I guess. So for you, it, you, would you say it's like about creating the time and giving yourself like a feasible timeline during which you feel comfortable taking as much time as? Well, yeah, I don't, don't take as much yourself. time as I need, but I think being realistic and healthy with myself, you know, but like, I think there, there are definitely if, yeah, you have to make faster choices if you're on a deadline and something's yeah. coming up and like, right. you know, you have to kind of go with your gut more maybe you know think about ways to 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 wrap it up you know um and it's funny it's like sometimes my best ideas come in that situation because like i'm not staring over myself second guessing you know everything and sometimes it's simpler and um simplicity is you know like sometimes it just sounds better you know i'm not like over complicating it by over i'm torturing everything with every single possibility you know so maybe maybe it's not good to consider every possibility, but uh, I feel like also when I'm, when I'm in like a rushed thing, I go with more more kind of decisions that I know are going to work. You go back to your toolbox and your your kind of more familiar things. So it's like a less risky way of writing. If I'm going to take risks. I need more time. That's interesting. So, I don't know. How about yeah. you? Well, one thing one thing that blows my mind is that story of Nelson Riddle writing mm -hmm. the arrangement of "I've Got You Under My Skin." In the back seat of his wife's minivan on the way to the recording session. What? Did you know that? No. Yeah, he literally wrote that, and yeah, with like the crazy trumpet, like ooh, do we do dee 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 dee, like the trombone thing, like da -ba -da 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 -da. I mean, come on, that's a that's a great chart. I love that one. I don't know if you can even tell what those notes are that I'm <laughs> allegedly <laughs> singing right angel, now. Even five. Yeah, three. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm not afraid to sing. Um, <laughs> maybe it should be though. Uh, you guys be the judge of that or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is, there's that story that blows my mind. And then there's another, there's this intermezzo to an Italian opera. I forget which opera, I think Cavalleria Rusticana. Mm -hmm. I think it's that one. I forget who the composer is, but, um, you know, when I was in college, I did a study abroad program in Florence, Italy, and I took this Italian opera class and cool. our teacher told us that this guy wrote, whoever the composer is, who, who after this interview, immediately after this interview, I'm going to search and and r remind myself of this this cat's name, but right now it escapes me. Italian opera people, we got like what, Puccini, Donizetti? Uh, it's not, um, it's not one of the big ones, that's the thing. Not one of the big ones, okay, um, well, let's move on, yeah. But he, but he, he wrote, he wrote that for a competition. Mm -hmm. um, and he wrote it in in four hours, and I and I remember thinking to myself like, how is Wait, that an possible? opera? Not the opera, the, the intermezzo. Intermezzo. The intermezzo, like yeah. So the intermezzo is the thing that goes in between Act One and Act Two, and they have like just the orchestra playing, like 
to wow. kind of get everybody back like butts and seats situation. It's like they'll ring the bell and then just to for good measure, then they'll they'll start like the the intermezzo and people are like, oh crap, I gotta go. And so they uh -huh. go back in. And so this this guy wrote I, in four hours. And I I mean, look, this is like a 250 year old story. So uh, in terms of how true it is, I I genuinely don't know. But but like it must be true because it's possible to write music that quickly. And but when I listen to this thing, it's it's so beautiful. And I couldn't fathom as a 19 year old person who was like, mm -hmm. you know, just starting to really, really explore with the pen. Like how could somebody write something so beautiful and so honest in such a short span of time? It's something that didn't feel pre-planned, something that didn't feel cookie cutter. And, and, and just for me, the knowledge that it's possible is mm -hmm. enough to for me to be able to tell myself like I can do it as well. Um, I think the process of decision making. I mean, you're you're presented with a series of choices, you know, in in the writing process that um, we have some autonomy over. Mm -hmm. um, as human beings, we're the ones in control of what we're writing, but in some ways, like the music that we're writing has, like it already exists and it's just our job to discover it. And so what I find myself doing is taking a lot more time at the beginning of the process and just like getting all of the potential ideas out mm -hmm. um, before I really start writing. And I'll spend like, you know, decent amount of time just like downloading stuff off of my brain or offloading stuff mm -hmm. really and then once i feel like i really have like like a like a good chisel in the thing like then i can then i can go and just just go because i feel like i've developed a relationship with a piece that i just have to uncover and mm -hmm. yeah it depends on the piece depends on the style of writing but that's you know that's typically um typically my relationship with the decision making process is that the decisions reveal themselves to me a lot faster once i know once i have a good relationship with the piece that i'm writing yeah i see i definitely am go i'm sometimes i'll be writing and i'll oftentimes ask myself where does it want to go from here like as if it wants to go somewhere you know i'm not as like oh it exists somewhere and i just need to like tap into it you know i'm but I, I do, I do sometimes like feel like, okay, it's taken on a Frankenstein approach, you know, um, where it's like, okay, it's, it's its own monster and like, I can help it, you know, I know where it wants to go, <laughs> but, um, totally. yeah, both are yeah. possible. We're, we're humans at the end of the day and like, we're the ones holding the pen. Mm -hmm. So we decide, um, just that curiosity. I, I love that. I love that feeling of, of curiosity. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like um, I, I feel like I've had different attitudes to writing. Like, there's definitely that like, you know, it's a job. You just got to sit down and treat it like a job. And I feel like I'd be less, um, you know, every note isn't one of my children that I'm like helicoptering. You know, like I I, I could just like you know, oh cool, this is a fine counter line. Let's go. Like if I were in a cab on the way to a recording session, I had to write something. I'd be like, here we go, great. You know, this is perfect. You know, um, but like I feel like there's a sort of right. like. Um, I like to indulge, you know, like I'm going to have a cup of tea and a cookie and I'm going to want to savor that and just like, you know, and I'd be yeah. like, cool, this is food. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. and it's kinda, I feel selfish, you know, some of my, my, my pieces I feel like are very selfish and indulgent because I'm like, oh, you know, I'm like taking my time and I'm enjoying exploring this and this and, and that's what makes composing fun for me. And sometimes if I'm like stressed and I got a deadline, like I'll, I'll write something great and it is, it does end up being fun, but like, um, there's something nice about feeling the freedom to just like, you know, to let it happen rather than to make it happen, you know, um, just like sit down at the piano and like mess around and see what happens. Um, I feel like I need to have a certain amount of playtime in my, in my composing. And I like, I like my playtime. Um, but I, there are definitely situations where I need to be, I'm like working, you know, so totally here, man. definitely once once I've got everything sketched out, you know, or not necessarily sketched out, but somewhat, you know, like, 
oh, I'm going to orchestrate this later, or this is going to be this kind of thing, or I'm going to develop this idea. There's definitely a sense of relief, and I like feeling relieved. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that too, man. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about um, the the uh, the new record you've got coming out in, in March. Let's let's shift gears here a little bit. Tell us tell us what this this is your third record with Assembly of Shadows. Is that correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So so uh, talk to us. It's called Heartland Radio, and um, it's uh, it's a it's it's more of like a a, a rocky kind of like. Uh, record like more indie rock vibes um, more electric bass on it um, I had a, I had a fun time you know uh, arranging you know that that Bon Iver song on my last record and, and doing that piece Neener Neener which was kind of influenced by like more indie rock stuff and then you know I just got to play with Haim and like do some stuff with them which was like really illuminating for me and I just feel like okay you know the first record Assembly of Shadows was very orchestral you know, the second one was kind of branching off from that. And now this third one is kind of where I was trying to go. Um, and so I'm, and I'm, I'm going to keep that orchestralness in my writing, of course, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I, this one's kind of fun. I like take on some, some different, I, I go some different fun places. You know, I, I thought about like the power of like the structure of like some of these like dance songs, like dance hits, like EDM stuff or whatever, like, um, and like pop stuff even, and just like, that's a powerful structure. That's a powerful device, that breakdown, that drop. Like, I want to explore those concepts without necessarily imitating them, you know, in the same context, but like, it's super powerful. Like, let's use that, you know? So I had fun with it. And I think all the songs are kind of like a little bit about my, you know, a little the the the, the the title track, Heartland Radio, kind of refers to my trip across the country from New York to Denver, moving uh, moving here in a giant 16-foot truck and just listening to the radio and all the stuff that was on the radio. And uh, my partner and I would play games. Like, um, there's, um, we'd, we'd put on the the radio and, and, and we would play a game, Is It Christian Rock? You know, because when you're, like, driving through the country, you know, there's a lot of Christian rock. And, and she could tell by the lyrics, you know, there would be certain, like, key phrases that, you know, you'd only know if you went to Sunday school, you know, which, which I did not. Um, but, um, but I could tell by the drum beat, there's definitely like an indie rock kind of Christian, rather Christian rock, like drum beat with a lot of toms, you know? And, uh, and so we, you know, so like on one of the songs, I've got this like really Christian rock drum beat that I, I had so much fun with, but, um, but yeah, it, I, I had a lot of fun writing music for this record and, um, and uh, yeah, I'm excited for it to come out. It's coming out on March 15th, and we put out one uh, single already, Stop and Go. And we've got another single coming. Nobody else knows this, but I can tell you, I, we've got a single coming out on February 16th that's going to feature Julia Easterlin, who's a killer vocalist. So, awesome. Yeah, so, so that's, that's the project. Man, so so much awesome stuff in there. I, I can't wait to listen to it. Um, I'm, your, I'm your fan. I'm so, your fan. Thank you, my friend. So, <laughs> but, so yeah, Heartland Radio. So, oh, um, okay, but you know, I was really intrigued by one thing that you said just about like my first album was this, my second album was that, and so now I'm doing this. Talk to us about the decision making process that goes into just presenting your artistry and craft over a series of albums like this one. I mean, it's just the flow of what I was interested in too, you know. So the first two, the first record and a half was one recording session. So like half of the stuff on my second record was from the same recording session as the first. I was just like, these songs need to go together. Like I had a five movement suite and then two songs that I thought really fit that well. And so I wanted to put those all at the same time. The second record, I had half a record and some some pieces that were kind of a different vibe. And I wrote some more pieces and then you know, um, and kind of, you know, piece that one together, you know, um, and I'm happy with how it came out, but I think the concept isn't as strong on Architecture of Storms, but like, I think the concept was kind of like, this is a continuation of Assembly of Shadows, you know, they both have the same syllables and initials, and I kind of meant them to be a kind of one, two, um, and they were mostly done at the same recording session. 
so the the third album is its own separate completely you know contained recording session and thing and um i got to kind of you know the first i mean it was my first big man record so like there was a lot i just didn't know i hadn't established like a, enough confidence and like didn't know what i was doing in some ways but it worked out great you know um but uh What's know, the biggest record. thing that you learned from your first record? Oh, I mean, I just had a little more, you know, faith in myself to, you know, be able to lead a band. The thing I learned from my first record is, you know, write, write for myself more as a soloist. I felt like I needed to treat it like a democracy when I can actually treat it like a dictatorship a little bit more. <laughs> a monarchy is better, not a dictatorship. I'm, 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 I feel like I'm, I'm a pretty benign monarch. Uh, pretty uh, sorry uh kind what what's the word uh never mind um but like uh yeah i think I, I felt an obligation to like feature a bunch of people and like i was like really trying to kind of please everyone and you can't please everyone when when you have like 20 people you just have to do what what's right for the music and take it where you want to go and um and so like if something goes wrong in the studio you can make a fly decision you can i'm like very direct with people in my band and i think you know, people, I think mostly people respect that, you know, um, and uh, if they don't, then they don't have to take the gig and, you know, but like, um, I like to have like a really open communication uh, with people and I, I'm not like mean about stuff, but like, I, I think I, I just learned that I can, I can be a leader. It's okay to like step in and lead and make decisions and, you know, disagree with people. Um, not that that happened very much, but like, um, yeah, and write for myself as a soloist because, like, I know how the song goes. I know my voice fits the song. My vocabulary fits the vocabulary, you know, as a saxophonist and as a composer. So, you know, um, I, it's hard to make somebody else perform certain certain compositions of mine because, like, I'm looking for such a specific thing. Um, so I either have to write for them, write in a very general way, or I just play it myself if I want something really specific, you know? So how do you know when you've achieved fun. that sense of clarity in, in terms of your, yourself and own self artistry to feel, to feel comfortable in those I ways? Know. I think it's a, it's a, it's a back and forth kind of thing in, in a way, but I think growing up as a twin, uh, something that shaped my sense, my, my, my kind of understanding of identity a lot as an artist, because like, we have, you know, we're the same person. Everyone perceives us as the same. So we would go out of our way to kind of try to be distinct from each other. And I think as artists, you know, um, we, I would like try to try to be different. You know, I didn't feel like I could play as fast as some people. You know, I, I can't play like saxophone as fast as Sam Dillon or Matt Morantz or, you know, like I, it's, it, but it's not like, but I, I instead like I would be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be different. I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna be you know I can't do this, so I'm gonna ex develop this other aspect of myself. That's how I thought about it in high school, you know. So like I don't you know speed is you know not that like when you're when you're like 16 like you're you're good because you can play fast, not because you have ideas. But I was like, oh, I guess I need to figure something else out to make me special because I can't play as fast as this person, you know. It's just kind of funny. But um, I don't know. Yeah, I think identity is something that's always been something that I've, um, you know, seeked out and put a lot of value in. And I think probably that has a lot to do with just growing up as a twin. Musically, was there a single right. moment? Yeah, man, it's super deep. Musically, was there a single moment where you sort of felt that you were you? Um, no. Um, I mean, it happened over time. Think, like. You know, I mean, I wrote something I was proud of in high school, but like, um, and started to kind of figure out my stuff in college. I think when I when I started to like be able to write on the piano, I started to kind of, you know, maybe my limits were the things that gave me an identity at first. You know, like, oh, I only knew these voicings, but they were cool voicings. And so like my stuff would have these voicings and my stuff would sound like me. Um, I remember at MSM when we were students, like, um, people would make fun of both me and my brother for our, our LaBeouf bass lines. We were really, like, everybody was real big on the left hand piano, doubling the bass, really active stuff at that time. Of course, of course. And, like, 
now it's almost like a joke, but it's also, it can be really cool. And I, I still do it sometimes, but like, I don't overdo it like I did in college. So uh, yeah, I, I definitely overwrote a lot in college, but it was, it was fun. I learned so much, but no, no, no real moment. I think the search, the act of search for, for individuality and like the act of search for like singular identity at some point for, for many individuals, especially artists becomes less of a focus on the act of search and more of a realization of just the acceptance totally. of who you are. Um, yeah. And I think that that can happen multiple times for the individual. Um, and I think that it's super interesting to hear you talk about it just from the perspective of being a twin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you guys are, are both totally, totally, you know, bad dudes. I was going to say something else, but I'll just keep it at that. And also totally individual and musically speaking, my, my ears anyway. Um, I recognize both of your, your, dudes, your maybe, or, your, uh, I recognize you know, your, the alive. difference of your sounds more than the difference of your faces. Let's put it that way, um, no, no. which I think is is beautiful. What would you say to yourself um, at the beginning of your journey? What is the one thing that you wish that you could tell yourself at the beginning of your writing journey? Now looking back, that you think would have unlocked some things for you sooner than you unlocked them. Oh, I mean, I'm happy with my writing journey. I don't know if I'd want to like tell myself anything to mess with it. I'm happy with the journey I went on. I think uh, uh, definitely, um, let's see. Yeah, I don't know. I thought that's a tough one. I'm going to have to, I'm just going to say, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't tell myself anything. I just, I just do it. I mean, there, there's certainly things I could have done better, maybe leave more space, you know, but uh, play more piano, write on the piano more and paper more, less computer. Because I think that stunts you a little bit, you know, if I that that would have kind of sped me a little bit along a bit more. Not that I did a ton of computer stuff, but there's definitely a, a time in my life. But um, but that's tough. Yeah. Um, I like what you said, too, about like, um, you know, um, just like what, what was it about about being yourself, about just kind of like. Um, um, maybe maybe just like uh, uncovering or like let, letting it happen in a way i forgot how you phrased it but it yeah. reminded me of something that mark turner said at a at a um at a master class when i was uh in college and he was like i was like how did you go about shaping your identity because i was like really obsessed with the idea of identity and like forming an identity it's like you are a person you have an identity already you know it's like mark turner was like i don't have an identity and i was like whoa <laughs> And then he explained it a little bit and it was like, that's really interesting. And I think like, you don't have to like force it, you know, it's like, we all, we all are ourselves, but I think we, we can like become ourselves. Like we have a hand in changing who we are or who we want to be. Um, I think we have that free will, you know, but, uh, but I, there's definitely a, a degree of like, you know, you don't have to establish that you're somebody unique and special. You can just, accept you use the word accept you know you can just like accept your yourself or just like let yourself be yourself you don't have to force it so much so i don't know but i i, I forced it a lot when i was younger for sure <laughs> that's cool man it's a beautiful answer there's no right or wrong answer of course the follow-up question that i would ask to that is you know you're you're a professor at university of denver mm -hmm. what do you find yourself saying one thing more than another to your students who are working on large ensemble writing that you could share with us right now? Oh, yeah. I think a lot of my students just, um, they, they or not my students necessarily, just students, like any lessons that I give, you know, there are a couple little things that people do a lot, you know. I think people overwrite a lot. They feel like they need to use the whole band. They write stuff that they don't hear. You know, I think that there's the there are people who like start arranging. They, they want to write for big band, but they don't know how to write a strong lead sheet first. Um, I think there's also um, you know 
certain things that I see a lot, you know, a lot of people like to write the double intro. Do you, are you familiar with this? Even from tell the BMI workshop? Tell, tell me more. Like, somebody will write like a rubato thing that's like, you know, a kind of rubato or ballad-like intro. And then there's the, and then it starts to swing. A boom, whatever. And then, and then the, the ostinato comes in or whatever. And it's like, basically you have two intros. It's like, well, pick one, you know, like, and then they don't even have to do anything to do with each other, you know, a lot of the time. So like, I think this brings me to the point that I, I think I want to make now, which is like, be, be concise and efficient with your, with your material. So like, you know, if you have a melody or a, a melodic, a, a theme, a, a little kind of, you know, three, four note idea, you know, that idea, you can get a lot of mileage out of that. And like, people are just like, go from one idea to the next and it's just like it's like a play where a new character comes in every you know couple minutes and then you're like oh, oh well where did this person come from it's like you can write a play with three characters and it can be a really strong play and you know that like strong compositions do that even standards like you know pure imagination from Willy Wonka has that in common with Bartok's second string quartet second movement you know it's like it's like just a couple themes and they they work really well together and the composer gets a lot of mileage out of it. And then they have a really strong character and the piece has a strong sense of itself. And you're not gonna write another piece that sounds like it because it's just so kind of soaked in those themes, you know? Mm -hmm. So, okay, those are, those are a couple of things, I guess. I don't know. That's all great, man. <laughs> well, I, you know, I have one more question for you before I, I check the, the Facebook group and, and, and answer the, the live questions that have come in here. And, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, before we, I, only I know this, um, mm -hmm. but before we started uh, our conversation that you said, hold on, let me move the Maria Schneider book from the piano desk. Can you share with us a little bit of of, uh, <laughs> of what you're working on right now? Uh, like what is front of mind for something that you are, and when I say working on, I'm not talking about commissions, I'm not talking about compositions. What I'm talking about is like, what are you working on right now to better yourself as an artist and a craftsman? Ooh. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, I feel like I don't have as much time as I'd like to really work on myself, you know? I just listening, I mean, listening to new stuff, um, collaborating with people, putting myself in an uncomfortable space sometimes, you know, helps with that, mm. but... Um, um, yeah, I, I wish I were challenging myself more. I mean, I, I'm definitely challenging myself because like if I, I get bored if, I, if, I, if I'm not, but um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as I'm teaching, teaching some of my students how to, you know, do things or like exploring new things, we like analyze things together and that's mm -hmm. fun. So like, I've got that Maria book up there, uh, the Evanescence Jazz Orchestra book, you know, and we were looking through hang gliding, which is, you know, one of her most famous pieces. And just, it's so interesting to write for a big band and then just see and be influenced by, you know, Maria, of course, you know, I think, you know, as many of us are, but like, yeah. um, and just see how differently she thinks about it. You know, when I get into her music, um, you know, how, how similarly she thinks in some ways, but how differently in, in other ways, like I can like, pick it apart with my student. We're like detectives. We're like, oh, what was she thinking here? Oh, it's interesting. It's this, this pattern, but it shifts in this way. Like, why did she decide to do that? Oh, maybe she did it this way first. And then was like, oh, I don't want that much space or I need a little more space here. So let's move it. Like, it's really, it's so much fun getting into people's heads and try to pick apart why they do what they do. But, um, but like the way that she really thinks in terms of modes on that piece, and some of the way that she voices things, it's it's just very different for me. And it's really, it's really fun to get into other people's heads, you know, not just yeah. to understand things the way that you would understand their stuff, but to try to understand it the way that they understand it. So I think maybe the way to challenge myself is that I'm working on now, and also as an improviser, is a certain amount of kind of like empathy, you know, with 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 my bandmates, like, you know putting myself in their position to think what, what do they want? You know, horn players, you know, us selfish horn players, you know, we don't think a lot in terms of comping a lot of the time, you know, you're used to trying to kind of amplify somebody's gesture or idea or support them a lot of the time. But like, even as a soloist generating ideas, you know, I think 
thinking a little bit more about like, how can I support my bandmates, you know, or how can I get into what, what they're trying to achieve here? Where are they trying to take the solo? And how can I help them take it there? You know, if I'm looking at Maria's score, it's like, where is she trying to take it? You know, like, and how is she achieving that? How is she thinking about this? Why did she make that decision? Um, or why did Bartok make this decision? You know, like, so I think uh, it's really fun playing detective with my students. Because, um, I mean, it's the stuff that I love checking out. I mean, or picking apart, like, Tom York's pieces with the smile. It's, like, so interesting. Like, I think teaching, teaching challenges me every day. I do it in a fun way, for sure. So, That's awesome, man. And also, yeah. I, I think it's super cool, too, to... Uh, to end on that note, because hang gliding is such a piece of surrender in so many ways. There's nothing. Surrender. You, oh, tell me more. There's nothing you can do if when you're hang gliding except for just accept that the wind is going to take you this way and that way, and you can direct yourself if you want to, up or down, left and right. But if but if 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 it gets to that and and uh, but if it gets to the point where a strong gust comes, <laughs> you have no choice but to go with that wind. I'm trying to find it. Um, but no matter what, it's going to be three, four, three bars of three, four, and one bar of two, four. The wind is always going <laughs> to. Right, right. <laughs> this isn't, me trying to find it in the score isn't worth making the joke accurate. Like, uh, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, and finding oh, and and uh, and finding by flashlight too. I feel the same sense of curiosity and adventure in that piece as I as I hear in, in hang gliding as well. And um, you know. I mean, yeah. I mean, like, well, it's Maria's interesting. Influenced like, us all for sure. Yeah, but you talked about like being yourself across different mediums. You know, I feel like Maria is definitely somebody who is like she's so herself, and you know, it it also brings a, a, on the, a, a, up the something that I've 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 thought about a lot is like, it's you can't escape yourself. You know, like, you know, there are a lot of kind of decisions that I make where you know my 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 mom who's the fucking best um uh, you know shout out to to my mom uh, but she'll be like oh that sounds like your other song <laughs> oh it sounds uh -huh. like you wrote a song like that already <laughs> yeah. you know? and she would know actually my and and my my spouse rochelle she says the same thing sometimes or pascal you know it's like there are things that i do that are patterns that i don't even realize i do myself and that's kind of scary to me and i think you know like maria definitely has a lot of patterns charlie parker has a lot of patterns you know and like, um, and uh, I feel like, you know, part of me is like scared that I'm just going to get trapped in my own patterns and, you know, and then all of my music is going to sound the same. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. But I guess that's, that's one thing that, that, that danger of, of like, you know, developing a stronger identity. Um, so I hope to just continue adding on to it and becoming, you know, an evolution, you know, the way that Maria is or the way that. You know, Miles Davis was or John Coltrane, you know, I feel like they evolve, you know. So anyway, yeah. Just going on tangents here. It's great, man. Well, let me let, let's just add with with one one question from the chat here. Uh this one's from Alex. Alex says, What things do you keep in mind when you're in the editing stage as someone who potentially writes too much and makes the piece a little bloated? Can you speak to that oh. a little bit? I mean, I think the question answers it. You gotta edit it, you gotta trim the fat. You know, that's something I definitely talk a lot with my students about is like trimming, trimming things down. You know, when we when we write things, it's like these are our ideas. These are our precious babies, you know, and we're we're really attached to them. But sometimes you just got to let them go. You know, <laughs> maybe you yeah. don't need that m much. Um, and things can become much more powerful when you start introducing the concept of absence. You know, taking something away and reintroducing it can make it just hit really hard. Um, or, or just oh, too many ideas at once, or, you know, I can definitely think of examples of, of my own, you know, I'm not gonna get into all the nitty gritty of things where I feel like I overwrote, you know, I think like Neener Neener, I've got some moments in there where it's just too much going on. And there are too many characters and they're all talking at once. You can't hear what anyone's saying, you know? Mm. So I think there's a, a kind of, um, like people sometimes feel like they have to use the whole band all the time or they have to make it complex for it to be valuable but um i think you know yeah i'm i think you can you can definitely like um make something stronger by making it clearer mm -hmm. you know i'm not more interesting to, to talk to because i i say things in a really complex way and i say a lot of things 
You know, this whole interview could have been a lot more entertaining to listen to if I said a little bit less, you know. I'm pretty entertained, Remy, and I'm super glad that you that you took the time to come on to to chat today um, for me and, and for everybody. <laughs> well, I wasn't um, fishing for compliments, but I mean, like saying some of the things I said in a more efficient way, you know. Some well, people are really good at that, you know. Well, you know what? The exploration for the the, the process of ex exploration for finding your totally. expression, you know, when we compose, can become a lot more precise than when we are improvising, and therefore, I think we composers, arrangers, and orchestrators as well put an undue pressure on ourselves to be the perfect, best representation of ourselves always, instead of allowing the music to just be more improv improvisational and more open. And I think that there's value in that as well. When I look back on my pieces where I feel that I could have done something different, mm -hmm. I'd take a look with my ears mm -hmm. and I and I say, wow, that was a missed opportunity. What is What am I going to do with the next one? Or what opportunity am I going to miss on the next one? And those are the things that that help that help me me grow. Um, yeah, Remy, dude, uh, I could I could talk to you, man, for for hours on end. I, I'm so happy you took the time to to chat today. Um, you're you're the man. Heartland Radio out on March 15th. New single February 16th. Can't wait to hear them. And uh, man, thank you so much. Great chatting with you. Thank you, Stephen. Cool. All right, Remy. Peace.